Okay, guys, as you can already see on the screen, we're gonna have a very special guest. We're going to do an exclusive intro with Dan Larimer. And really, we're discussing everything that is interesting about EOS today. We're discussing EOS 2.0, we're discussing EOS VM, we're discussing the social network that is gonna be launched, uh, which is uh, called Voice. And really, there are so many different things that we need to discuss and so many questions I had about Voice that I got the opportunity to ask Dan. Also, we're discussing what Block 1 has been doing for the past year and what they're gonna be doing in the future and so many other topics so many other discussions that we had in this entry yeah and as usual smash the like smash the bell and share this video this is the most important thing you need to do right now share the video with the eos community with everyone who you think will care so share this video right now and let's okay dan larimer welcome back to the show amazing to have you here we spoke approximately one year ago a bit more than one year ago and that was before eos was even launched it was pre-launch and it is very good to have you back here because so much has happened you recently had your event uh, in in dc we're going to discuss what happened there and we're going to discuss different announcements for example voice for example web authn for example web assembly uh, eos vm and everything else that is happening there but first of all i want to hear what has happened to eos since we last met here on the channel approximately a year ago it's been a busy year uh we released eosio last june and since then, the community has adopted it, and there have been many different chains deployed, including the EOS public network. Uh, and uh, according to blocktivity.info uh, and some of the DAP radars, it's the most active blockchain and the highest daily active users of, of any blockchain out there, at least uh, um, smart contracts. But how so. do you really, how do you measure, because that is an interesting topic in itself. You see, for example, Tron also claiming that they have so many users and so many transactions, but also people are figuring out that some of that data is fake. So how do you view that uh, stat space of analytics and statistics when it comes to dApps? Because it is so easy to fake the information and the, the usage. Well, it is easy to fake it. Um, Block One does not engage in manipulating statistics like that. We do our own testing. Um, but you can just look at all the different companies and all the different projects that are out there. There are a lot of projects doing a lot of things. Uh, and um, we really believe that there's real usage on the EOS network for a number of different things. Um, but this is an opportunity where a platform like Voice, which has real identity tied to every single account, you can actually know that this is real data, and real usage versus uh, bots and uh, anonymous usage. Right. It, it costs yeah. money to transact on, on networks. You have to have token stake and, and things like that. And if you look at the types of things people are doing, uh, it looks like it's real activity versus artificial. And so we will get into voice um, later in this video. Uh, and you mentioned that it's been a busy year. And um, also we've had a busy year following everything that has happened because EOS also has evolved in many in many ways. So one thing I uh, I think about is, for example, the ECAF uh, story and the ECAF as an organization that you, you had this arbitration process and people could decide collectively in this arbitration process, for example, if we should blacklist an address because that address is involved in hacking or some other shady activity. So how would you say the EOS community has evolved? Because my understanding right now is that ECAF, this arbitration organ, is not um, is not longer existing. You're correct. ECAF is no longer an element of, uh, of EOS. It was just something that was written into the original constitution. Uh, we've, you know, the community has adopted its own uh, replacement constitution. Uh, and that basically just documents and reflects what the block producers are already able to do uh, and just makes it clear that they, if two thirds of the block producers as elected by the majority of token holders um, decide, then they can upgrade the protocol. Um, but it, it, generally the community has opted for um, not trying to recover people's accounts if their keys are lost because it's so ambiguous. Uh, there's still room for the block producers to act if a contract misbehaves uh, and, you know, it's pretty obvious what the intent of the code was, that, that type of thing can be fixed. But the, the blockchain as a whole is no longer subject to one entity that self-appointed itself to have total control. Uh, it's very decentralized. And in reality, it's always been decentralized because the block producers uh, we're not bound to follow the ECAF rulings, and, and sometimes they didn't. Uh, so 
we made censorship very difficult. Uh, all the block producers had to unanimously agree to censor. And if even one disagreed, then transactions could get through. And that happened sometimes. Um, some people critiqued us for not having it fully enforce the blacklist, but that was actually part of the, the feature. We didn't want to censor things um, that didn't need, uh, that have universal approval. Right. And, and so when you see these developments, for example, the remo removal of ECAF, you say that it's been decided in this decentralized manner that now it is up to block producers and it's always been up to block producers. But uh, what have you been doing? Have you been involved personally in these issues or have you taken more of a step back and let the community decide uh, most of the decisions? What is your role right now when it comes to EOS, EOSIO and the whole community? Block One's focus has been to make EOSIO the most flexible and powerful blockchain software. We try to stay out of the politics of, of the chain, except where it interfaces to technological requirements. So we've been producing the software to enhance things. Um, it wasn't until voice that we finally started engaging with the public network, um, but uh, we're doing so as a user of the network, not um, as the operator of the network. So you had your event on June 1st. Many people were very excited about that. And you announced voice, you announced uh, web authentication uh, and the collaboration with uh, YubiKey. You also announced EOS VM. So let, let's get into those topics. Let's start sure. with voice, which is the social network. Uh, why have you chosen to do yet another social network? Because you did Steam in the past. So why are you focusing on that one use case? Is it because it's your favorite use case to create social networks or wh what is the uh, what is the drive behind that? particular application? Well, blockchains are all about uh, freedom of speech. Uh, you can view every blockchain transaction, something you want to say. Social networks are just free form speech and communication and collaboration. Uh, you know, you, how do you build consensus with people if you can't have an open forum for discussion? So social media is very, very important for discussion. Uh, it's very important for decentralized governance. Um, yeah, no blockchain project in the past has tied real identity into the equation the way that we are doing with with voice and we think that's going to enable some very powerful applications not just for the social media aspect but also for other applications that can leverage uh unique and identified users to have new game theory mechanics new there's just a lot of opportunities to to leverage on that and so uh so social media is also a great way to get mass adoption you give people tokens every day just for signing up, you're going to get a lot of users. You know, those users will come for the social media and stay for the other blockchain applications on it. So one of the issues with uh, Steam, it was the fact that you had so many bots and people could manipulate the algorithm and game the system and uh, basically get money for that. So it was an incentive to cheat. Um, and with voice, you're saying that, okay, now we're going to have uh, authentication and you need to verify that you're a human. Uh, and so you can do it in several different ways. I mean, you could just do KYC like call exchanges. We need to send send in passports and uh, electricity bills and all of that. Uh, how will you do it? Will, will it be like exchanges or will it be biometric? Will it be like with an iPhone, you can scan your fingerprint or face? Can you share some details on that? Or sure. uh, let, let me uh, dispel, dispel some myths of, uh, that I see very, very frequently. The idea of using biometrics to identify people, that's like saying I'm going to use a password to authenticate people. There's a reason we use private keys. I can keep my key private and prove that I possess it. You can't keep your biometric private and prove that you possess it. They're fuzzy. They don't translate into something objective that's measured. Your sensor on your iPhone that's scanning your face or your fingerprint, it's doing fuzzy logic uh, and trying to see does it approximately match within some tolerance. And then it unlocks a private key and uses that private key to sign things. So there's never gonna be any DNA, face scanning, iris scanning, those types of things. That's just password-based authentication and you can't put that on a blockchain because anyone that has that information and is able to verify it is also able to counterfeit it. So um, blockchains use private keys for authentication. Uh, a, a KYC process is uh, required by regulators for anybody who's doing uh, tokens. Um, if they want to be compliant. So we're turning that and we're leveraging the fact that, hey, if we have all these users that have to be KYC'd anyway to have a token, uh, now we can use it to provide an even better experience on social media platforms. So it's probably going to be that you send in your password or ID uh, like on normal exchanges then? 
yeah, block, block one will have to do that. Obviously, we want to make it as easy as possible, as seamless as possible, get people to get people onboarded and involved. Um, but we also want to make sure that it's uh, transparent and that the community can verify that we aren't creating fake IDs and that we're not getting scammed because you know, that's the benefit of transparency. Uh, I've seen a lot of people ask the question, well, what information is going to be public? The only information that's going to be public on the blockchain is going to be your name and your country of residence. Uh, everything else, you know, we might have to get your electric bill or something like that to verify your country of residence, but that all stays encrypted and uh, in a secure database uh, just for, for compliance reasons, not because, uh, so we take privacy very, very seriously, uh, but people also need the benefit of knowing they're interacting with real people on the internet. And that's what voice happens to give you. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the token, uh, token metrics and token model. Uh, so you mentioned uh, at your event, the fact that I get tokens if uh, if I participate, uh, if I just have an account. Uh, I also can use my tokens in order to raise my voice. So I comment on something and then my comment can be shown higher. Uh, how else can I gain tokens? Can I get to tokens if somebody likes my, my content, like on Steemit? That is correct. Yes, so the, it works. Um, we learned a lot with Steemit. One of them is you don't want to reward inflation according to how many tokens people have. It doesn't matter how many tokens you have. It matters how many unique people like what you post. And uh, the more people that like what you post, the more tokens you make. Uh, and unlike, um, you know, we have equations that don't make it completely linear so that you can't just get a couple of your friends together and vote it. You actually have to produce things that are liked by a large number of people uh, that uh, in order to get large amounts of rewards uh, from inflation. When you use your tokens to move your comment to the top, of the comment section or to um, or to promote a top level post, uh, you're actually spending your tokens. So uh, that's very different than what you do on Steemit where you can just like and it doesn't cost you. Uh, you can just, I guess there's the supported post on Steemit, but this is, this is very different because if somebody else comes along and wants to voice a particular post and comment, uh, you get your tokens back and they go back to the top. But not only do you get your tokens back, you get a little bit more because each time someone voices their comment, um, they have to pay more than the previous person. Mm -hmm. so, right. So it, yeah. it's, it, it becomes like an auction. If I, yes. have, I raise my voice and somebody else can raise their voice and then I will get my tokens back. So is there some kind of time limit? When is the last person? How, how yeah. much do we wait? Yeah, so it's like an auction uh, where every time someone outbids you, you... Uh, you get a fraction of the increase back. So there's incentive to, to bid because you might get outbid. Um, and when you win the auction, you get the visibility. And the benefit of visibility is more people might like what you see uh, and therefore you can get rewards from, from likes as well. Um, so I think there's some other aspect of that question I didn't answer, but. Right. And so let's say I want to advertise would voice be a good platform for that? Let's say I, I go to a person who has a lot of these tokens because they are credible and uh, I KYC myself and I can pay them in the fiat, in normal uh, currencies, and then I get voice tokens. Can I then flood the network by spending that basically as ad budget? Uh, will that be possible? Yes, you, you can post a comment uh, and your comments would be the top comments on a lot of posts. You're going to be spending a lot of money um, doing so, but uh, yes, you absolutely can use this for promoting ideas. That's the idea. When you want to voice yourself, you're just advertising your ideas. And that can be for personal ideas, political ideas, or business ideas. What kind of content can I post? Will it be live streams? Will it be just texts? Will it be videos, images? What do you support? Uh, you can support uh, text, long form, and short text. Uh, you can do photos, and you can embed YouTube, Vimeo, uh, and uh, other platforms as well. And for now, it seems that you have just an app. Will it be on the web as well, or will people only have to do use use the app to interact with it from the beginning? Uh, it's it's going to first actually be a web application, uh, and then followed with a iOS and Android app. 
so when I spoke to some blog producers, they told me that right now you cannot really deploy voice. And really, it has to do with the fact that, that they need to update to EOS 1.8, uh, as I understand it. So why is that? What needs to happen? And uh, when do you think it will be launched, approximately? Sure. So we want to make sure that the user experience is amazing for voice. And that means that we don't want the users you sign up to have to think about network resources. Do they have enough CPU? Do they have enough RAM? Uh, this is why uh, we're providing all the RAM and we're going to provide all the, all the CPU for the users. And with EOS IO 1.8, it's possible for another account to pay for the CPU and network resources uh, of their users if they co-sign the transaction. So we'll be co-signing the transactions with the users if they want us to pay for it. Obviously, if they want to pay for it themselves with their own stake, they can do so. But we want the user experience to be seamless um, for that. And what is the issue? Why don't we just deploy it? Uh, I've heard that uh, one block producer says it's going to take weeks because they need to replay transactions. Another says it's going to take months. So there seems to be different opinions on how long time this update is going to take. Not because it's not finished, although that is also a thing that they said that it's only release candidate version for now. But the big issue is that they need to replay a bunch of transactions. So uh, would you describe it in the same way or why, why do we have to wait? I it's primarily just a challenge of getting everyone, not just the block producers to upgrade. This is the first uh, hard fork upgrade where hard fork is defined as requiring all full nodes to upgrade in order to stay in sync. Uh, you know, EOS has a very powerful system contract that allows us to do a lot of things with just the block producers updating things. But this one uh, fixes a lot of issues, makes a lot of improvements uh, that we've discovered over the past year. Uh, and so it's, some of those hard forks uh, take a little bit more coordination. And so we're, the community has to do that. We've had a release candidate out for 1.8 for a while. Uh, and most of the incremental changes are uh, small bug fixes and, and, and improvements, but nothing major. So people have already upgraded to 1.8 on test networks and so on. Uh, it's really just a question of how conservative does the community want to be. Uh, you know, block one's kind of got a, we call it a release candidate, but we've been uh, waiting on community feedback before we finalize it. So you know, when we make a release candidate, we think it's ready to go. Um, and making it a, a final version just means that we think it's ready to go. The community's tested it and they think it's ready to go. Um, but that's been a little bit of confusion there, uh, but we really have a lot of confidence in the status of 1.8. Approximately how much time will it take, if you had to guess? I don't know. I Probably a couple months. And it, does EOS have a testnet as well, so that we can, for example, try a voice on a testnet? Or how do you, how do, you do this development? Do you yeah, only we, run it internally, or what is the process? Yeah. We have an internal network uh, that we've built, and you know, we do all of our testing there. We've deployed the contracts there. And then we simulate user data. We take all the Steam content and we pump it into our private one just to see how it all works. So we've got a version of voice that looks just like the content you see on Steam, it, except uh, running through our smart contract, going through our infrastructure. Uh, and that's how we've been testing it internally. Uh, and you know, soon we'll be sending out invites to, for people to sign up and using our, our internal test. Mm -hmm. I have already signed up, so I, I hope I get an invite. When it comes to voice, I think that is the most exciting news for, for the end user, for the end consumer. But from a technical standpoint, I think you, you did some interesting things as well that may be even more interesting than the actual social network. For example, the integration with, uh, with WebAuthn. So for all of you guys who are watching, WebAuthn is the standard right now. It became the standard in March, as I understand it. Uh, and that means that now you can have basically a hardware wallet, but you can authenticate with uh, applications online. For example, you log in uh, on Facebook, you can use a hardware wallet-like device, but this device is used uh, by Google, by big corporations already. So Dan, can you please explain to us why is WebAuthn so important and um, uh, what kind of changes will we see within the EOS ecosystem with WebAuthn? Sure. So WebAuthn is a, a web standard. It's integrated into all major browsers and it uses private keys to sign you into a website. Uh, what this means is that if you're on Google devices or Apple devices with secure enclave, 
that you, you're basically logging in with your fingerprint uh, and face ID uh, to the website, which is great. You got a hardware wallet API built into your web browser. Unfortunately, uh, blockchains can't validate those signatures currently. And with the USIO, we did something that no other blockchain has done, well, that I'm aware of. Uh, we supported the uh, signature type that's used for uh, secure enclave. So while you can't have a Bitcoin wallet that uses Apple secure enclave to store your private key as a hardware wallet, you can do that with EOSIO. And with WebAuthn support, you can now validate WebAuthn signatures uh, in addition to the R1 elliptic curve uh, signatures, uh, which means that every web app uh, can now have access to your hardware wallet built right in uh, to your browser. You no longer need to install a Chrome extension. Uh, if you've if you've got um, sorry, if you got Secure Enclave on your device, you've got a hardware wallet right in your Chrome browser uh, and Microsoft Edge and uh, Safari and all of them are adding support for it. So uh, by rather than trying to ask the industry to change to meet the needs of blockchain, we said, well, we can change the blockchain to be more compatible with industry standards and leverage the infrastructure. You know, companies like Ubico are creating uh, keys that are very, very secure, distributed everywhere. People already have them. Uh, companies give all their employees these for free. So why not use these to secure your application? Uh, one of the benefits of, of WebAuthn is that you can now have a, a key tied to a particular domain, which means that unless you're on the web app for that domain, you're not able to sign transactions with that key. Uh, so one of the problems is you use an app on one domain, it steals your key and then does something somewhere else. But now you've got keys that are scoped to domains, uh, which sort of creates a multi-factor authentication and provides accountability. You know that that domain had to be hacked and you had to have your key in order to sign it versus, hey, I, somehow somebody got my key, I don't know how or where. Um, so it really helps you place liability uh, for the hack on, on different parties and makes you more secure. It's interesting that we talk about this topic because just yesterday there was this uh, huge news that Apple did the crypto uh, crypto kit library and many people misunderstood it as it was something to do with crypto but in, but in reality it was mostly with cryptography and so uh, when I read the news, uh, also some people commented on that, and people said that, you know what, actually when you generate a, a key pair with CryptoKit, it will place it in the secure uh, enclave if the device supports that, but you will not be able to see it. So there's no real way to back it up or, or get some kind of a phrase to write down. Is that an issue or is it possible somehow to still, oh. to still use the Apple devices and have them as hardware wallets? On EOS, it's possible to use it for securing your keys. Other blockchains that don't support the R1 curve can't use Apple's CryptoKit uh, to keep the keys in hardware. I believe that the future of security is all keys are in hardware. They can never leave the hardware. And instead of having a backup of your key, you have multiple keys associated with one account. And that's how you do your backups uh, combined with things like social recovery of your account. Uh, that is the future. The idea that you have software keys that can be copied and, and stolen and used without a physical device, uh, that needs to go away. And we need to have new systems that are much more like the physical keys that we have uh, in the real, real world. So let's say I want to build a DAP, I, I want to use EOS, uh, and I'm using web technologies to do that. So I'm using HTML, JavaScript, and then I basically tell the browser in the standard way that all browsers understand, okay, now I need to sign this transaction. And then the browser will go and, the, for example, if it's on iOS, it will go into the secure enclave and then maybe you need to scan your face. And if it is on desktop, maybe you have to uh, touch your YubiKey or, or some something similar. So uh, my question is, do I need to think about uh, something special as a developer? Do I need to uh, learn some kind of EOS interface to make this happen? Or do I only need to care about the standard web authn interfaces? Well, we've got the uh, USIO Authenticator Library, um, the UAL, <clears throat> that abstracts all these details. So you don't have to worry about whether the user is using a YubiKey or Scatter or um, our, our USIO 
app that we just uh, open sourced and is now in the App Store, uh, which I actually would like to take a moment to talk about. The um, uh, Authenticator app we released, I think, is really game changing because it's the it completely abstracts the process of approving a transaction from any particular blockchain and makes sure that the user knows what they're signing. Uh, even with a, a YubiKey, uh, it can sign a hash, but you can be tricked into signing something because you don't know what that hash represents. You're trusting the website that's proposing the transaction. Uh, you, you see on the screen, I'm transferring money to you, uh, and you click send, and it brings up a thing, do you approve, and you say yes. But maybe it was actually asking you to sign something that it didn't show you on the screen. You still signed it. No one got your key, but they got your money. Um, so that's that's a problem. Uh, and that can be mitigated with things like time locks and so forth. But with our ESIO wallet app that we released, uh, every single smart contract has a human readable description of what's going on. And there's a, a, a automatic way that you can substitute the variables for say transferring to, from, and other things into the human readable form, associate icons with every action, human readable names instead of computer function names, uh, as well as showing which blockchain with an icon for the blockchain, the name of the blockchain, the name of the app, uh, can all be put and displayed to the user. And everything that's displayed to the user is hashed into the transaction. And then if any of that information is not what's on the blockchain, the transaction is invalid. So maybe they can trick you into signing something by changing the terms of a contract or whatnot. But the blockchain will reject it because the blockchain verifies that the recording contract, the interface, the icons that you were shown are what is supposed to be shown for that. And that connection of uh, you have one app that you trust to accurately present the terms to you, and that only that app can authorize a signature. Um, and then all other apps out there, they have to present you a, a human readable description of what it is you're going to sign for you to authorize it. I think that the security model that we put forward there needs to be adopted by the wider industry. I think also it's a, it's a format that many people know how to use already today, even if they don't know about crypto. I don't know how it is in other countries, but in Sweden here you have an app called Bank ID. And you use Bank ID to log into your bank, but also to log into your uh, tax a site you, lo you use it everywhere and all companies can also integrate with bank id if they want to authenticate you for real so by having that experience it will be very similar uh, and so for example i'm using a dap on uh, i'm using my google chrome browser on on the phone i, I go to a dap and then dap will basically open up eos authenticator if it needs something signed and uh, do we still need to have that authenticator as a as a middleman because couldn't the dap just uh, open up uh, the face ID uh, thing, or does it need to go through, well, through the authenticator? The, the, um, if the app has its own private keys, it can use face ID. And if you bless the app with that power, then the apps can bypass it. But the purpose of the authenticator is to make sure that the app doesn't have a blank check to, to say, hey, sign this and scan your ID and now it's signed, right? You only have to give trust one app with the blank check to sign anything, the authenticator app. And it has a very simple job. Take the request for signature, present in human readable terms what you're about to sign and so that you can actually approve it. Um, and if it, that very narrow scope of what it's doing, it's like having a, a lawyer that takes a request, explains it to you before you sign it uh, versus appointing, you know, I'm gonna trust this app to ask me to sign something. I'm gonna sign it blindly. Uh, because that's how people have been doing things today. Let's move on to the second uh, tech uh, tech topic I want to discuss that you also had on your event, which is WebAssembly. So right now when I program EOS contracts, I use C++, then I compile them, and they, then they are turned into WebAssembly code that, uh, uh, that can be executed within the execution environment of EOS. On the event, you mentioned that you're gonna take WebAssembly and make it more blockchain compatible. You're, ga you're gonna change this, WebAssembly is a standard, so you're gonna change it, make it more blockchain compatible, you're gonna call it EOS VM, and it's gonna be 12 times faster. So what do you change exactly? How, how do you take sure. WebAssembly and make it more blockchain compatible? WebAssembly is a language. We're not changing WebAssembly. We're changing the software that executes the WebAssembly. So it's like having a new CPU. We're not changing the instruction set, we're just having a faster CPU. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and we do that. You know, there's, there's lots of ways you can accelerate WebAssembly. You know, the browsers compile it down to x86, and, and they can run WebAssembly very quickly. And uh, ESIO already supports some compiled WebAssembly that is much, much faster than we have today, but we can't use it uh, in real time. We can use it for replay and maybe for some private chains. We can't use it for real time because uh, there's so much variance. The code is written so that um, depending on what someone submits, it might take seconds to, to compile the, the WebAssembly. And when you're producing a block every half second, you can't have that high variability. It leads to an attack surface. So you need very, very predictable uh, validation and compilation times. Um, and all the other WebAssembly engines are designed for browsers or standards development. Uh, they're designed to help the people that are expanding the WebAssembly standard or want to manipulate or transform WebAssembly. Uh, and therefore, they're not really designed for execution performance or for the security considerations associated with the blockchain. If you're running in a browser and something goes wrong, uh, your browser might crash, or maybe there's a two second delay before an app starts. That's not a big deal, because once it's running, it's fast. But on blockchain, you need to, every contract execution is uh, starting the environment, running it. Uh, every time someone uploads code, you have to do this. Um, so we really needed to reduce the attack surface to make the WebAssembly engine as simple as possible, focused on executing code uh, versus all the other requirements out there. Uh, there's another aspect of blockchain that's different than in your browser. Uh, and that is we have tight deadlines. So whenever you submit a transaction, you might have one millisecond, maybe two milliseconds to run it. And if it doesn't complete, you have to exit the program. Uh, which means we have to catch infinite loops and other attack vectors. Um, and to do that today, we inject function calls that basically say, are we done yet? Are we done yet? Every time you enter a new block of code. And that hurts performance uh, significantly. With EOSBM, we built that into the execution environment so that we can have a, a timer and another thread it just waits. And when time's up, it, it kills it. And so it's like, preemptive exiting of your uh, of your smart contract without overhead on on every call. Uh, there are a no, number of other improvements, but we, uh, we changed how the memory allocators work to make it more efficient. Um, we made it a library that's easier to integrate with. You know, the, the libraries from browsers are so tightly coupled to the browser that it's hard to integrate them into other projects. Um, so there's, there's a lot we did to make it run faster and more secure and more predictably. Uh, and and we just, you know, this is a, a big step forward and we're just beginning it. So uh, we're talking about the speed that we can execute WebAssembly. This is, does not mean that we have, uh, you know, five times more transactions per second than we had before, because WebAssembly is just one small component of the overall performance of the blockchain, which includes signature verification times, network, propagation times, database access times, uh, and none of those things are accelerated by WebAssembly. That said, if you've got a CPU intensive algorithm, uh, speeding up WebAssembly will have a dramatic effect. So WebAssembly focuses on the execution of the code, and that is only one part because then you also need to propagate everything, you need to sign things with cryptography, that might take time. And what you've done to summarize, you've made, you've removed all unnecessary things, you've made it easier to integrate uh, and uh, and made it so that it's not only browser-based, you've uh, made the memory more efficient uh, with allocations, and uh, yes, and that is how you, you achieve this, this increases in speed. And as I understand it, this is going to be EOS 2.0. So it is not in EOS 1.8 that block producers are trying to release right now, right? Yeah. So this new virtual machine, uh, any node can upgrade to it once the it's fully integrated. It does not require a consensus change. It's completely compatible with the existing network. Right. So there are no consensus changes. You just take a component and you make it and and you make it faster. Uh, yeah. And and they they're all communicating with each other as as they did. When is that going to be complete? Is it already now usable or is it still just in, in the beta version? Uh, we've got a version on that we've worked with, passes all the spec tests for WebAssembly. Uh, we can run benchmarks across all the different ones. Uh, and these are WebAssembly benchmarks. We're in the process of integrating it with ESIO. Uh, and uh, we hope that to be out in the next month or so. 
what is the future of uh, of EOS? And um, uh, maybe I think people are more interested. What is the future of Block One? Because you launched, uh, you did, you did not launch, but you you gave the community the source code uh, in June last year. This June, you did an event. You introduced new technologies. You introduced a new app. Uh, is it going to be a yearly event that you're going to do? Uh, what what is your plan for the future? Well, uh, we plan to continue producing great products, great applications to scale EOSIO. Uh, our vision is still to make it multi-threaded execution. EOSDM is a step in that's designed with multi-threaded support uh, in mind. Um, so we're going to continue to push the boundaries uh, and make EOSIO the best platform to build on, uh, you know, to replace the databases that we use today. And is there anything else you would like to tell our community before before we wrap this intro? We discussed so much in this interview. We discussed voice. We discussed EOS 1.8. We discussed EOS 2.0. WebAuthn, WebAssembly, role of Block One. Is there something else that you feel is very important for our viewers to know? Well, I'm just super thrilled with all the stuff the community has been doing, the the projects they've been building, the support they've been giving. All of this stuff is not, uh, you know, we can produce amazing technology, but without the community out there. Uh, adopting the technology, using the technology. Uh, we, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I just wanna thank everyone involved there. Um, and we look to continue to create great tools so the community uh, can do amazing things. All right, then. Thank you so much for being on the channel once again. Let's catch up maybe in six months, maybe in a year and see where, where EOS is. I wish you good luck. I wish you block one good luck. And uh, let's see where the blockchain goes as a whole, as a whole industry as well. All right, well, thank you very much for having me.